And Dr. Alan McDonald found these small worms, nematodes, roundworms, very small, in the spinal fluid of every single uh, patient that he tested, 100%. So we are doing a series on these filarial worms because this is such a huge discovery. And I've shared in the other series why. Number one, because number one, he found the presence of these filarial worms in the spinal fluid and the brains of every single MS patient that he studied. Number two, when these worms are present in the central nervous system of domestic animals, they have symptoms identical to multiple sclerosis and other chronic diseases, other neurological diseases. Number three, we have had a lot of students in the Live Disease Free Academy and the treatments that are working well to treat those filarial worms are some of the leading treatments that are really helping people to recover. So those are just three really important reasons why we need to study this topic and why we have to understand what these parasites are. And that's what we did in the first few parts. So part one was talking about just the link and the presence of these small worms in the central nervous system of MS and other chronic diseases, neurological diseases. Part two, we looked at what they are. Part three, we looked at, um, so for part three, let's see what do we, animal studies, that's what it was. Sorry, I just went blank there for a minute. So it was animal studies. And that's really important because in animal studies, very often scientists and researchers, when they study animals and they study diseases in that animals, then later on, years later, they discover dis similar diseases in humans. So that's how we have figured out certain diseases in humans by studying diseases in animals. So we looked at, last week I talked about different studies where they're finding these filarial worms in sheep and horses, even camels, I believe in uh, buffalo, cows, cattle, goats, different animals, like I think dog, dogs and cats also. And when these animals have these these filarial worms in their central nervous system, what kind of symptoms do they have? They have all the symptoms similar to MS. So they will have extreme fatigue. They will have weakness in limbs. They will have numbness, spasticity, balance issues, paralysis. It's shocking the similarities. And so 50 years ago, I shared like one of the researchers 50 years ago, a group of them, they said, we need to study this in humans because there could be a link of these filarial worms causing disease in humans. And nobody has touched this since the 1950s, except for Dr. Alan McDonald. And I've shared his research previously. We'll talk more about it later, but I just wanted to get into, I got some great slides for you. So today, um, because we do not recognize these filarial worms that they would be a problem in developed countries. So we don't really have a lot of tests. Our doctors are not familiar with these parasites. They're not, I'm sure there are tests, but it's just not readily available. So when I work with students, I call them the wellness champions and they have to learn how to play an active role in their healthcare. So the topic today talking about testing is really important because this is where you can talk, like if you wanna be a trailblazer and you wanna help bring change, you can be talking to your practitioners and talking about, well, there is research, Dr. Alan McDonald, not Pam Bartha, right? Dr. Alan McDonald found worms, these filarial worms in the central nervous system of every MS patient that he tested. And veterinarians have known for a hundred years that these worms cause all the symptoms of MS, not just MS, but we're finding that different neurological diseases like PLS, et cetera, they're having great benefit by treating, using treatments that would treat these worms also. And so then you can say to your, your doctor that, you know, this is something I'd like to explore because I have all these symptoms similar to what animals would have. Um, is there a disease uh, or an infectious disease doctor that would see me like and talk about possible tests? And if you know what tests to ask for, then maybe you will find somebody who's open and willing to do some testing. So this is it's interesting, I've had to go to places like India and different countries where there's a very large population and where they have 
outbreaks of these filarial worms. And we know that I've shared in previous videos that these filarial worms, different species, so different types of them like to live in different parts of our body. Some of them like to live inside our lymphatic system and they cause swelling. Eventually we can have uh, that elephantitis, but that would be not common. And what I've all the reading I've done is that a lot of times when we're infected with these fil filarial worms, it takes years. So maybe in our childhood, we were affected, infected by them through mosquito or a biting insect. And then years later, <clears throat> as an adult, that's when we have the stronger symptoms, whether it is the swelling or whether they are living, a different species might live in our skin and we might have a change in the pigmentation of our skin. Sometimes they move into different organs and some of them move into the central nervous system and cause these horrible neurological symptoms. So it's important to, to understand what kind of tests we have available. So I put together a few slides. I'm gonna head over to the slides right now. Hopefully everything should work just great. Yes, there we go. I'll have to move myself around. So, and then at the end, I've got a surprise for you. One of our students, and if you don't wanna look at the worm, that's fine. But one of our students uh, yesterday shared, because we just had our Live Disease Free Academy Q&A call, and she shared a, 27, a picture of a 27 inch worm. And I'm gonna share that with you. And we're gonna talk about that. So when I'm talking about filarial worms, if you've been following my work, you know that it's not just the filarial worms that we're suffering with. When we have serious chronic disease like MS, PLS, ALS, Parkinson's, we have severe dysbiosis. We have things like um, fungi, fungal overgrowth, different types, not just candida, could be aspergillus. There's hundreds of different fungi that can make us sick. We often have always have parasites and it could be big worms, small worms, round worms, flat worms, possibly tapeworms and you really don't know what you have until you pass it and that's with this student and you'll be just shocked what came out of her and she had an immediate 25% improvement in her symptoms and I'll share all of that later. But today we're going to talk about the little tiny worms that get into the central nervous system and the tests that are available. If you enjoy this information and you also want to help me get the word out, we need to start talking about these infections. We need to get this to our practitioners. We need to get this into different groups. We need to start discussing this. We need to have other people researching and following the resources that I have available and really diving into this, we need to bring change. Please like and, and share this video. You can help me get the word out. If you enjoy my trainings that I give, make sure to join the my YouTube channel. So subscribe to that and that is Live Disease Free. You can also hit the notification bell and then you'll know when I go live. I'm gonna be going live a lot more often in the next couple of weeks because there's a lot to share and we need to speed up this process. So starting off with the first slide here. We're going to look at four different types of tests. There is direct evidence of microfilariae or filaria. So those would be, there's two types. There is the adult form and there's the immature form or the, the young ones, the, the, ch the babies, etc. They're not babies, but they're growing. Those would be microfilaria and then the others are just filarial worms. So we can look for these immature forms, the microfilaria. We can also look for the adult worms. They would be located usually more in different parts of the body. So we talked about if we look at just one type that would cause that lymphatic edema swelling, the adults like to live in the lymph nodes and then the, the babies, the larvae, the immature forms, they move into the blood and so they're taken up by the mosquito because they need uh, two hosts. They need the mosquito to be passing them on to a new host. So we can look for the immature forms. We can look for number two. We can look for the adult forms. We can do some immuno immuno immunological tests, sorry. And the immunological tests would be looking at our immune system's response to these worms. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then there's a few other tests. Let's look, talk about the direct evidence of 
the immature forms. So this can be done by looking at blood smears. So this is where they take a drop of blood and they put it on a slide and they examine it. And they like to do it two ways, a thin and a thick blood smear. I'll show you right now a picture of that. So you'll see that the thin smear is where they would put a drop of blood on the slide and then they would take another slide and kind of push it to make it thin. And then they have a thick smear. So they like to look at both, which is just a drop of blood. So it'll have a lot more concentrated and you'll be able to see more of the different types of cells in it. So they will look at our blood and it's really important. I'm going to say this a couple of times because when you're talking to your infectious disease doctor, if you're really fortunate to do that, you have to tell them that, that many of the species are nocturnal. And so they will, so these immature forms, they aren't going to be out in the main bloodstream during the day. They will come out more at night when we're sleeping. And that coincides with the activity of the mosquitoes. They're more night feeders. So this is not true for all species, but it's true for a number of them. So that means that after 10 p.m. till I think 4 a.m. in the morning, that would be the time when you would have the greatest success of finding more of the worms, the, the microfilaria inside the blood. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be stained. So a lot of times when we're doing microbiology, we will stain um, slides so that different things will show up more. But these worms are quite large compared to our red blood cells and our white blood cells. So it's pretty easy to see them. So you, they look at stained and unstained slides. And depending on the species, they can also be detected in other fluids. So sometimes they'll look at lymph because sometimes they like to live in lymph and in urine also. But mainly in the blood from what I gather. So looking at this, this would be a, an example of blood smears or slides. And this would be a filarial worm or the microfilaria, so this is the immature form, and on the left-hand side, you'll see that that is a thick smear, and on the right, it's a thin smear. So on the thick smear, you can see the red blood cells, white blood cells better, but those are actual pictures, and you can kind of see how big they are compared to our red blood cells and immune cells. They're, they're very noticeable. And before I go on too, I wanted to share that these are some pictures of the filarial worms in. I'll move myself out of the way here so that you can see a little bit better. Oh, where do I put myself? I'll make it smaller. There we go. <laughs> so here are some actual pictures of slides of what how they found these worms in the blood. So you can see how big they are compared to our red blood cells and our white blood cells. And a really significant thing that I feel is really significant is that one of my students, probably two or three years ago in Europe, a med student who had MS, she pricked her finger like she's in med school, right? And so she would look at her blood and she would look at another lady's blood that had MS. And she said it was really easy to find these worms just with a finger prick test and to examine the blood drop. So I don't, I'm not sharing her pictures because she's been doing research and she's going to publish a paper and I'm not allowed to put it on online yet until it's published. But these are definitely examples of what you would see or what I saw on her slides that, or the pictures of what she had in her blood and another person's blood. So this is what is in the blood. I believe that a lot of people have some of these worms in their blood. Maybe not a lot of worms, but it's the degree. And it's also, are, have they entered into the central nervous system? That is the big thing. And when they have entered into this nervous central nervous system, I believe that's where we have a lot of the amplification of certain symptoms. All right, so going on to the next slide. So these are some example pictures of the, the worms. And you can see that on one end of them, they always have, it's called a sheath. So. It's kind of, if you, I don't know if you can see, but on, just look at the worms and you'll see on one side, it's more dense. And on the other side, it's like almost, you can see through it and that's the sheath. So on the more dense side, that would be the head and the other side would be the tail. Okay, I'll move myself over here again. All right, a little bit bigger, perfect. 
All right, a second way to test for these filarial worms would be to look for the adults. And if we're talking about the lymphatic infections where they live in the lymph nodes, sometimes they'll do a lymph node biopsy. So they'll take a little bit of the lymph node and they'll look for adult worms. Also, they can look at using ultrasound. So they, they will look for, and they were talking about even in the kidneys, in the renal area, and also just, just abnormalities in the, the lymph flow or the lymph fluid, so with the ultrasound test. So those are two different ways that they will look at adult or look for the adult, detect adult worms. There's also immunological, I said it right this time, <laughs> immunological tests. And that would be looking for filarial worm antigens. So we know that all these different microbes that get into our body, especially the pathogenic ones, well, they all carry antigens. So it could be proteins, it could be carbohydrates, different things on their cell surface, or maybe they die and they release things. So antigen is something that's foreign in our body and our immune system will recognize that as the enemy. So if it's present, if antigens are present, our immune system will detect it. And so they can use an ELISA test or rapid testing. They can also use an ICT test. They can also look at antibodies. We know that the antigen tests are a lot more accurate than the antibody tests. And that probably has to do with, is it an active infection or was it a chronic infection that your immune system is not maybe eliciting a very strong antibody response at the time. And also a skin test where they actually will inject antigens from these worms into the skin and see if we get a reaction to that. There's also a PCR test. So these are other tests. And so these, I'm just giving you these names so that you can talk to your doctor. A PCR test is where they're looking at the DNA, but they have to be able to get the, the worms. And so they will analyze the DNA. So there are many microbes that they've already figured out the, the genome, the, the map, the blueprint of specific organisms, microbes. We all have, us humans have specific genome and different animals, different insects, different, all living organisms will have its own unique genome. And so if they know the blueprint of a certain microbe, they can run PCR tests and they can see if, if this is a specific even up down to the species but there again do they have the, do they have all the different filarial worms sequenced at this time probably not maybe some of the more common ones that would be a problem in india and africa and different countries in europe and in south america but that is an option too and eosinophilia is where we would have a higher than normal amount of eosinophils which is a type of white blood cell that will go after parasites that will destroy parasites, and then elevated antibody test. I honestly believe that with all these different tests that the blood test, the smear, is going to be the most helpful. And that's what I'd really like to start as a study. And I am just doing the groundwork right now as far as, you know, what I haven't done a clinical study before. I have a science degree, but there are different people, doctors and nurses, etc., that are willing to help. But it it is gonna cost money, so we're trying to figure out all of this and build a plan. But I honestly believe the first step is to find these worms in the blood of MS patients and different neurological diseases. And also to see if there is a st statistical difference between the presence of these worms in people that have chronic neurological diseases versus people that are really healthy. And then the next step would be to look at the spinal fluid and that is invasive. That is something we don't want to have the spinal tap. It's, I would prefer not to, but if we can find these worms in the blood, I would assume that our doctors would feel more comfortable treating. And that is, and so I think that's really simple. It could be a simple prick test. Oh, and I wanted to mention too, on this slide here, the importance again of doing the testing at night where the worms they will come out of the little capillary vessels and they will go the capillaries and they'll go into the bigger blood vessels and that they're easier to detect then but you can also experts can also do a, a dec a dec provocation test which is where they will 
give their patient one dose of this parasite drug that treats these filarial worms and that will cause some of them to move into the blood to die or to be I'm not sure how many will die but it'll definitely make them show up during the day so if they do that one hour after they give the dose of DEC then they can collect the blood and examine it for these worms so that is another promising thing so if you know if our doctors don't want to test us after 10 o'clock at night they probably don't they could simply do this so that's another great option all right <laughs> so now what i'd like to do is show you the this worm picture so if you guys have any questions about what i shared about the different tests available go ahead and type your questions in the question box right now i'd like to share with you because if you follow my work you know that multiple sclerosis and all chronic serious chronic diseases are caused by severe dysbiosis we our students have passed many many very big worms and then all all the way down to these tiny filarial worms they have a lot of fungal overgrowth not just candida aspergillus and others they also have many symptoms of the infections of lyme disease they probably have other bad bacteria that we don't even know about yet there can be uh, clostridia species uh, chlamydia pneumoniae there's so many different microbes and we can't we'll never probably figure out every single one because I don't believe that it's the same for every single person because we see that people are testing well for different drug treatments even with the same disease similar but not exactly the same all the time but the key is that all chronic disease is a state of severe dysbiosis and to recover to get the best best health we have to treat the big ones we'd have to treat parasites roundworms flatworms possibly tapeworms we have to treat fungus and we have to treat the bad bacteria and knocking them down building the good up using a holistic approach just thinking about popping a pill it's never going to happen it honestly won't happen but if you support the body number one stop feeding the infections number two support the body and then you start to treat build back the natural defense and build a healthy lifestyle doing all those important things that's where the magic happens that is where we have people getting their life back where they had no idea that it was possible and what's so exciting is that there is so much recovery that we can have that we didn't know was possible our wellness champion students are showing that all right so i'm going to go to a worm picture so this helps you to see so we were talking about tiny little filarial worms and now i'm going to show you a 27 inch parasite that one of our students just passed a couple of days ago and i'll share with you the symptom improvements that she had also i just got to find her symptom improvements and gets right there yes awesome okay if you don't want to look at a worm turn away it is laid out clean with a tape measure but i think it would be really wise for you to look because this wellness champion she's working she did the prep phase and supporting the body and she's treating and she's done a few treatment cycles and she hasn't passed this worm until now so that's the important thing to understand is that the treatments we're using that's why we have to use multiple approaches you can't there's not just one pill that's going to get rid of this big big worm or and we've had a lot of students passing very large round worms they can be up to over three feet long so I'll let you see this but if you don't want to look at it just turn away and here we go here we go <laughs> what's going on here there we go and I'll move out of the way so when she passed this and she, again she had no idea she had parasite this long does she have another one I don't know she might I don't know what type this is um, but she shared with me that she said, I'm doing a really good job with keeping the carbs down, doing daily enemas, supporting the body, currently taking the antiparasitic meds that she tested well for. Today, I saw a 27 inch long worm. I definitely felt at least 25% better when I released this. Amazing. So she shared that for her, the, so she's recovering from MS and her biggest complaints are neck pain, back pain, and leg spasticity. And they all improved 25% just with passing what she passed here. So since starting the meds, I've been forgetting my cane 
again and walking a bit without any assistance at all. This is so exciting. So that is <laughs> truly amazing. Um, I never in a million years thought I'd ever be doing this kind of work, but it is super exciting. And I've passed a lot of parasites myself. I have not passed a long worm like this. Maybe I still have one. I don't know, but I don't have chronic disease right now, but I've passed definitely roundworms, I think up to at least 10 inches long. And in the past, when I started treating, when I learned about all these parasite drugs, and also I believe that they are intestinal flukes. A lot of our students have these flat worms. They're about three inches long and they're translucent and flat and probably about a centimeter wide at least. Um, so we're seeing all these different parasites. I have hundreds and hundreds of pictures of these worms. So enough of that, I'm gonna go for, if you guys don't wanna look at that, here we go. So I'm gonna see if you guys have any questions for me. I hope you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Hello, Aurora. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Dominica. Hi, Sean. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Debbie. Yeah, some of you I know have passed some pretty good worms that are listing right now that are wellness champions. I've seen them. So you remember seeing a video by Dr. Who did an autopsy on multiple sclerosis and he found some sort of microscopic organism in their brains and spinal fluid. I am so sorry that your brother died a year ago from uh, PPM, so primary progressive multiple sclerosis. I'm really sorry to hear that. It probably was Dr. I'm pretty sure it would, would have been Dr. McDonald because that's the only one that I know has found the filarial worms in every single MS patient that he examined, every single one in the spinal fluid, especially in the spinal fluid, but also in the brain. So I it probably was him. And if you want to, if any of you want to listen to his lecture, I would encourage you to listen. I would encourage you to share it with your neurologist, your general practitioner with different MS groups. Get it out there. You can find it on livediseasefree.com. In the main menu, there is a research parasite section. Go down to the parasite section. I believe it's the first one. There's a direct link to it. Grab that, watch it, get excited, and then pass that around to every place you can. He should win a huge award for this. I can't believe that this is not getting out in mainstream yet, but I can tell you that we have had over 700 people in the Live Disease Free Academy and since we've learned that in the past two years or so, the vast majority of people with MS, they test really well for the drug treatments that treat these filarial worms. And we're gonna talk about that next week. We're gonna talk about treatments. So, and I'm really sorry that your brother died of MS. That's why I'm doing this work, is I pray that we can get, we can get this information out and we can have people treating the cause and getting their life back. Where do these worms come from? If you watch some of the previous in this series, there is a several part. Again, what are these worms would have been two weeks ago. And the gist of it is that we're getting them through biting insects. So mosquitoes really is would be the main vector for a lot of them. But it could be other biting insects, but for sure mosquitoes, awful. It's amazing that a mosquito can give us a worm parasite but they pass the immature forms, the small ones. And Dominica, what causes dysbiosis? That's a really great question. So for the vast majority of my students, there was a time in their life when they were on antibiotics. Sometimes it's just two or three times. Sometimes for like myself, I was on antibiotics for acne. I was taking them for months. And when we take antibiotics, especially the broad spectrum, I took tetracycline, which is a very broad spectrum, it really devastates our good microbes. So in our intestines, and if you haven't watched my masterclass training, I talk, I teach a lot about that, how we normally have a healthy ecosystem in our digestive tract. When we go on antibiotics, it wipes out the bad bacteria that might give us the sore throat or the bronchitis, et cetera, but it also devastates our good microbes. So it wipes away a lot of our natural defense. 
And then we are susceptible to whatever parasites we pick up in our environment. So maybe there's parasites on food that's coming in from another country. Maybe we're eating in a restaurant and the person who is preparing our food didn't wash their hands and they're passing something to us. Or maybe it's coming in from produce that wasn't washed. Sometimes from our animals, for sure. I grew up on a farm. We had lots of animals, still love animals, have a dog, uh, etc. We had everything. We had pigs, dogs, horses, cats, <laughs> everything, every animal and bunnies. So they're in our dirt. Maybe we love to garden. And so we can get these parasites from the dirt, right? They're everywhere. We cannot avoid parasites. We have been told incorrectly that parasites are not a problem they're not around they're not in places that are advanced or developed countries they're only present in the underdeveloped countries and nothing could be further from the truth they're everywhere yes we do attempt to municipally treat our water so we're not drinking raw water out of rivers etc but there are times when our chlorinators don't work and we are i know that for a fact i'm almost six years old and I've lived in many different places in Canada and there are times when sometimes the water chlorinator doesn't work and everybody's like oh I've got a stomach ache in the house what's going on so we can't help but just be exposed to them it's part of life and if we have a really strong healthy ecosystem healthy microbes then we have this barrier that really discourages the bad parasites from becoming established in our body but because a lot of us have been on too many antibiotics and other medications that really devastate our natural defense we're a sitting duck and whatever we're exposed to those bad fungi bacteria parasites they can start to grow in our intestines and in time they work their way into our bloodstream they move into different organs into tissue into our central nervous system Again, with these flarial worms, they're saying that usually people are infected when they're children and it's not until later on in life that they start to see the problems of the swelling, right? And other symptoms, the, the skin issues, the organ issues, the central nervous system issues. And that is really important to understand. It's not like we just got a mosquito bite, we got the parasite and we have a neurological disease. It takes years for these infections to number one and and life to wear down our immune system to the point where they become too populated and then we start to have immune dysfunction we start to have a lot of inflammation that's the war zone where our immune system is fighting these infections and that's the process so in the live disease free academy what and the system what we're doing is we're helping our students to number one stop feeding the bad microbes parasites fungi and bacteria and, and to feed the body, but not feed the infections. We can't starve them to death, but we can definitely make their life miserable. Then we also focus on supporting the body because they've been sick for a long time. So doing a lot of things to build up their body, that can happen in three weeks. So within three to six weeks, our students are ready to start treating. And then we help them to build a game plan. So we have a lot of experience in how to get testing and how to get access to the treatments with practitioners, etc., and what is safe. We have to know this because even when we find a practitioner that will work with us, usually they are not all very experienced with these treatments. So you want to know how to use them safely while you're working with your doctor, how to pay attention to avoid Herx Herxheimer reactions. And that's what we help our students to do. And we have lots of wonderful successes on my masterclass training but also on our website live disease free and also on youtube live disease free if you want to hear these inspiring stories of people getting their health and their life back from incurable diseases and they're not they're just caused by infections and a lot of it is parasites that and we didn't know that we did not know that years ago hi mary beth yes they definitely will you just had brain surgery so you definitely have to follow all the steps and you just have to make sure to get extra rest right now that's really really important but you definitely will and as i mentioned my mom had brain surgery and she followed even just the eating plan she didn't have chronic disease she had a non-malignant tumor and luckily it was on the outside of her brain and they were able to open up her skull and take it out but she followed this eating plan the live disease free eating plan 
and she recovered so much more quickly. So make sure to check that out on YouTube. Uh, there's a playlist we have for the eating plan. And like he, she was the doctor's star patient because she, I think she was out of the hospital in two days from that brain surgery. And she, it's not a spring chicken. <laughs> so amazing. It's really, really helpful. Yes, you definitely will. And uh, you wanted to ask a question which might reveal whether your mother has parasites. Yes, definitely. All these symptoms are caused as we get older and older, the burden of parasites becomes greater in our body. And really, by the time we die, we have it's really our our body is shutting down because we have too many of the bad microbes in our body. So the more that we can learn about managing the microbes to keep the bad ones down and the good ones up, the longer we live and the better quality of life that we will have. So she is 93 years old and she is using a cane, maybe a walker, maybe a wheelchair. She feels like she needs that. If she went through this process, she'll feel a lot younger. I can guarantee you that that's, there's no question in my mind. All right, see if there's any other questions. Linda, has anyone tested for parasites and not had them? There has not been a single student that I've worked with that has chronic disease that does not have parasites. Our immune system does not attack itself. When we have chronic disease, it is because we have infections. Parasites are not just worms. Parasites are anything that lives in us. They're freeloaders, they're eating our nutrients, they're depositing their microbes, their disgusting microbes, their waste inside of us. It can be bacteria, it can be worms, it can be big worms, little worms, and it can be fungi, etc. That's what's that's what's making us sick, Linda. It's not that we just have this mysterious thing that's taken over our body. And even people that don't have chronic disease, but they have irritable bowel, they might have just gas, constipation, bloating. That is, you're out of balance in your intestines, you have too many of the bad microbes, and it's always parasites, fungus, and bad bacteria. Hi Vicky. Hi Patricio. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Dominica, my husband is okay. Mold, let's see. Laura. So I can't give medical advice on these calls. That would be irresponsible of me. I don't know anybody that I'm talking to, but you have to work with a practitioner. It's not something that you can just do on your own. So it's very important, but I will talk about the names of the drugs, absolutely. So Fawn, you're, just want, you're saying that it's beyond you why doctors don't want to acknowledge that worms can cause multiple sclerosis. I understand why they don't. The doctors, us human beings, were very prone to being programmed. When we go to school for 10 years and we're told we're the experts, there is nothing people can do, the drugs, the MS drugs are the only answer, you start to believe it, right? And you start to believe that you are the expert, this is the only way, this is your whole world, you're in this bubble. And I believe that at the very top of the whole healthcare system, they know, absolutely they know that infections are causing it. There is no money in treating infections. There is no money in treating parasites. There's a lot more money in keeping customers for the rest of their life on these expensive disease modifying drugs that cost anywhere up, upwards of at least $10,000 per treatment per month very often of the newer drugs. None of them work. They all suppress our immune system. Our immune system is not the problem. Our students, when you treat the infections, your immune system just works normal. You've decreased the enemy. The war is not out of control anymore and your immune system is able to function properly again. So the excessive inflammation is just an unfair fight. It's an overwhelmed immune system which these, there's many ways that these microbes cause immune dysfunction. And the sad reality, Fawn, is that there is such a control 
from the top down on social media and in our news and with our healthcare professionals to keep this information from the public because we would we would be able to just cure people of different things with treating the cause, especially early on. We have students that before diagnosis, maybe they have a number of MS symptoms or neurological symptoms. They believe they have MS. They're, they're trying to get a diagnosis, which can take a long time. Or maybe they were just diagnosed within the first year or two or three, and they find the Live Disease Free Academy and they go to work and they start treating. Within three months, some of them are symptom free. Within three months, they still have to treat longer because there's hundreds of eggs and immature forms and biofilm, et cetera. But it's so simple compared to when we've had it for years and years. Um, so we're going to talk a lot more about treatment. And I've been learning some things too that really help because some of the drugs will treat the immature forms, but not the adult forms. So we could be killing off the immature forms, but then the adult forms can keep making babies and keep infecting us. And so it's really important to understand our enemy. And that's why we're doing this series. So I would encourage you, if you have MS, if you haven't you know, followed any of my work yet, watch the series that I have on the filarial worms. Watch all the, I've got a lot of videos, just pick and choose what's important to you. The eating plan is really important to start with because you'll start to feel a lot better when you decrease the carbs. And then when you're ready, when you're ready to treat, if you need help, reach out, go ahead and watch my masterclass training, book a time to chat with me. You can become a wellness champion this week if you'd like. And next year will be the most amazing year you've had in many, many years. So it is really frustrating, Fawn. And that is why, thank you so much for your kind words. And it is super frustrating, but I can't do this by myself. I need the wellness champions to get the word out to share, to share Dr. Ellen McDonald's work, to share the videos that I have. Um, we can do it together. And that's really important. So if you can like and share it and help, help us to bring change. You had to retract the last sentence spelling. <laughs> no worries. You are so well. Thank you so much for your kind words. So here we go. Just a couple more questions here. What can I say about the MS education? I, I can believe it. Now you've seen it in action. That's a pretty disgusting worm, isn't it? So are worms always present in your students? Rob, yes. 100%. That's what's making us sick. Absolutely. It's not just fungus. So I know when I was first diagnosed with MS, and I never shared if you're brand new, I, some of you might be brand new finding me for the first time. I was diagnosed with MS over 30 years ago. And back in that day, I learned about candida and of course parasites, but we really didn't know what we were dealing with. And so candida was really the focus. And of course I went to different integrated practitioners and they did herb, they used herbs for parasites, but I never cleared the parasites. I know I still had, even though I didn't have the MS symptoms, I still had dysbiosis in my gut, just had to really be strict with what I ate, etc. following the plan. And I still do because of longevity. Like I, it, it gives me energy. It makes me feel good. I love eating this way. But I can tell you that learning how to treat parasites has really, really um, opened my eyes, even what came out of me when I wasn't even sick with MS anymore. So I was able to get enough of the smaller parasites down and fungus, etc., with what I did, but still needed to go farther to treat these parasites well, better. So this is something that all of us should do at least once a year or twice a year, not even just sick people, but once our wellness champions get well, they deworm themselves at least once a year so that they never end up with a parasitic infestation again. Yeah, that's right, they're not strong enough. I love the herbs, but on their own, they're not strong enough, for sure. Crystal. Are they in your blood and brain already and cleansing colon? It's not enough. You're absolutely right, Crystal. So in order to like, if you don't have any neurological symptoms and you, maybe you just had, let's say irritable bowel, maybe celiac, you know, something like that, gas, bloating, constipation, eating the wrong foods bothers you, but you don't have the 
the numbness, the paralysis, the spasticity, the drop foot, extreme debilitating fatigue, balance issues, all those things. If you don't have them and you just have more gut issues, you can start with the herbs. You can start with diet and herbs, but we still found like myself, like not having MS that until I used, and again, the drugs that we're using, we're using safe doses, but by themselves, they're not just getting them all out of getting the worms all out of your body. And so that's why we're using a strategic approach where we're using herbs, parasite drugs, oxidizing agents, but we're also doing a prep phase before. So we're really reducing the food to them. People are feeling a lot better before they start to treat and supporting the body. And then we use multiple treatments like layering and that's how this student passed that 27 inch worm. So she's done a couple of, at least a couple of cycles, I think probably more. And it wasn't until this time that it actually came out. She's passed some worms, but nothing this big. And we just don't know what's in us until it comes out. And then we go, wow, uh, that's why I felt so horrible. And could she still have more? And that's the thing is she's passed that 25% improvement, but she still is working on other parasites too. So she's not 100% better yet, but definitely improving and it's wonderful she's not using her cane all the time. I'm so excited to work with you too. Yes, why don't you just book a time to chat with me and I will definitely explain that for you. Okay, Elvira, I'll definitely explain that for you. So just watch my masterclass training. You can book a time with me and I'll explain that. Uh, so Crystal, you have, you were diagnosed with MS. You look like a beautiful young lady. And I would really hope that you would look into this and that you would treat these infections because you can get back to living an absolutely normal life and better than normal because you've had, just like I said, with the filarial worms, usually we've had them for years and we've had dysbiosis for years. It just gets to a point where we step into chronic disease. When you turn that around, you're going to feel better than you have felt in years. So Clee, they are tissue. Um, some of them are. Some species move into our tissues. Absolutely. They like to live in different areas. So there is Ceteria digitata, which is one of the types of filarial worms that Dr. Uh, Dr. McDonald talked about. And he believes there probably some, there could be different species, so there can be different kinds, but that could be one of the worms that are present in the spinal fluid. And with those, uh, they, their main host, their favorite host is cattle. And so if we get them by accident, and we don't even know, like this is a growing field. So maybe they are a human pathogen too, right? Or maybe it's just that they're not as common here. And it, when I was listening to the educators, they're talking about the researchers, they're saying that it it's more prevalent in really highly populated areas and where there is a larger amount of the worm present, et cetera. But that doesn't mean it isn't here. So Dr. Alan McDonald, he, he proved that, that it is present. He's, I believe he was in the United States. And so he proved that in developed countries, these filarial worms are present. And this is something that is a really growing field. It could be that if we have them in our blood, we might have something like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. As they move into the central nervous system, we start to get more symptoms of the neurological symptoms that are associated, not just with MS, but other neurological diseases. So, and, it, and some, some of them move into the eyes. Some like to live in the eyes for sure and cause river blindness and just cause blindness, et cetera. And some move into their tissues and into our um, skin, under our skin, and lymphatic system. That's a really big one. And a lot of our students have edema, like when they're starting to work at treating them. So that is definitely a part of it. So I, I feel like when we do this, this study, I bet that there will be people that have filarial worms in them that do not have MS but it's probably the degree and have they moved into the central nervous system. You're very welcome. All right, with that, I'm gonna let you guys go. We've been on for almost an hour. 
So next week, we're going to talk about treatments. And I know that's your favorite part. And of course that is, but I really hope to help you to understand that there is never going to be just one magic pill cure. If there was, I would have written a book about it. I would have, I would have just been done, but it, it's not that easy. And that is just the reality. But when you follow these proven steps that we've learned and we put together in our live disease free system, you will see that that it does take a bit of strategy. It's not super hard, just some simple steps and that that you can recover. You really can, even if these little worms get into different nooks and crannies in our body, crevices, etc. You can recover. It does take some diligence and persistence, but it's definitely doable and it's super exciting to get your life back. So again, next week, we are going to be talking about the treatments of filarial worms and make sure that if you're at the place where you're ready to treat, that you're like, Pam, I've watched a lot of your videos. I get it. I want to start. I want my next year to be, I want it to be mine. I want to get on with my life watch my masterclass training, how myself and other wellness champions have recovered from MS and make sure to like and, and share this video. Help me get the word out until next week. Take care and bye-bye for now.